Okay. All right, so our next talk is by Young Jensen. He will talk about the similarities about QM, QMMM, and the polarizable forces. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, what I tell you about today is uh, it's a work in progress. Some of it has been published, a lot of it hasn't, and I'll, I'll tell you some of the, the plans we have for this, for this method. Uh, I should start by saying that this, uh, this is really the work of Casper Steinman, who's sitting right there, who is a PhD student in my group. And also, this is done in, in collaboration with Dmitry Fedorov at, in Japan. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of uh, methods now being developed uh, aimed at increasing the speed of ab initio calculations through fragmentation. And so the idea is basically that you, you write the total energy uh, as, a, as an expansion in many body terms. Uh, so here I've just written it up to two body terms, but of course it, it, the, the series continues. And then the, that they all have that in common. Uh, what sets them apart is how you deal with the truncation, right? So the tricks you do to truncate this as, as early as possible. Uh, and that has mainly to do with polarization. Uh, and so I'll show you, uh, or I'll talk a little bit about how, whoops, how FMO does it, uh, and then to sort of to use that to contrast it with, with what our method does. Um, so FMO does uh, monomer calculations, but uh, these calculations of the monomer is actually done in a field of, of all the other atoms, okay? And so that is to include many body polarization uh, through the Coulomb field for, for, these, for these atoms. And of course, that is done so you can truncate this as early as possible. And most of the many body effects come from uh, Coulomb polarization of the charge density. Uh, and so of course that, the field changes the, the density or the charges or the Coulomb field Right, and this Coulomb field also uh, affects all the other atoms, so you have to iterate this to self-consistency. So one thing to remember is that even, even though it's, it's called a monomer, it actually uh, knows about all the other atoms. Okay, uh, since you only have the Coulomb field in the monomer calculations, uh, you now need to make corrections for uh, short-range effects. Uh, such as ex exchange repulsion, and to do that, then you do dimer calculations, uh, ab initio, if they're very close. Uh, and so then you get exchange repulsion, charge transfer, and, and, and things like that. Uh, this is done in the, again, done in the Coulomb field of the other uh, molecules, but this is not iterated to self-consistency. Obviously, this dimer calculation will change the, the charge density here, but that effect is not included uh, for, for cost, reason, uh, cost reasons. Okay, so that, um, here I chose a dimer calculation where the atoms are very close. Uh, but if the atoms are far away, you also do a dimer calculation. Uh, that is uh, because when you do the monomer calculations and the dimers are far apart, you use uh, a, a simplified representation of Mollikan charges, for example, to to model the field. Uh, and so if these are far apart, you correct for this by using frozen densities. That is to say, you do not do the SCF if these are far apart, but you use a density representation, uh, a full density representation of both. So you go beyond the charge model. Okay, so that's the, that's the FMO method. So we're uh, applying some tweaks to this. Uh, basically what we're doing is we're combining or merging the FMO method uh, and the effective fragment potential method. And so that, uh, which leads to this name here. So here the idea is it's a little bit different. Uh, we still have a, an expansion in many body terms. We truncate, uh, so we just do dimers. The monomer calculations are really monomer calculations. They're done in the gas phase. So this water molecule does not see these other water molecules. I have these water molecules here just to remind you that this is not a single calculation on a water molecule. Obviously we do the monomer calculations for all these water molecules because they all have different internal geometries. Uh, after we've done the gas phase calculation, then we extract multipoles and dipole polarizability from the, from the ab initio wave function because we're gonna do that, we're gonna use that for the next, uh, the rest of the terms here. So now we have multipole polarizabilities on all the 
water molecules, and so now we calculate the, polar, the entire polarization <coughs> energy of the system. Okay? So this is iterated to self-consistency. The electric field here induces dipoles. These dipoles right, will induce other dipoles and other water molecules, and so we iterate that to self-consistency to get many-body polarization, basically to, to infinite order. Uh, and this is computed classically, like I said, um, using induced dipoles. Okay? So that will hopefully allow us to truncate this early without incurring a lot of error. Then we do dimer calculations. Uh, uh, so, and again, we have two kinds here. The, the closed kind, where these basically have, are overlapping. So we do an ab initio calculation on the dimer molecule in the absence of all the other water molecules. Uh, when we do that, we have to remember that we, this term also contains the polarization interaction of these two water molecules, so we have to subtract that again. But otherwise, this is simply a gas phase calculation of the dimer, subtract the gas phase uh, calculation energy, calculated energy of the monomer. Okay, and of course, again, this is to get the non-skewing effect. If the fragments are far apart, then we calculate the interaction, the, the Coulomb interaction using multipoles. So static multipoles uh, that we calculate from the ab initial wave function of the gas phase molecules. And so we usually go up to quadrupoles or octopoles and all the atoms uh, on, on all the atomic center. And of course, the polarization interaction of these molecules is already taken into account. Here. OK, that was based for Hartree Fock. Uh, to get MP2, the current implementation, and as I said, this is a work in progress, uh, we calculate the correlation energy, MP2 uh, correlation energy. Again, for closed dimers, we do an MP2 um, calculation and get the correlation energy. If these are far apart, then we, we set it to zero. And that's actually in, in uh, straight MP2 FMO implementation. Okay, and so of course then there are cutoffs of what is close and what is far away, and you can adjust that uh, by comparing with regular MP2 calculations. Uh, I should mention here that uh, for correlation we go to MP2 and not DFT. Uh, so DFT doesn't scale well in this approach, at least in our hands, and that is because uh, in games where this is, is uh, implemented, the calculating the, the, the grid part of the calculation is very time consuming. And of course, the grid part scales linearly. And if something scales linearly, then this fragmentation approach is a very bad idea because you end up calculating the grid, for example, of this water molecule twice or three times. Right? So the DFT calculations are not very much faster uh, than regular DFT calculations, um, both in FMO but also in EFMO. So for correlation, we really focus on, on MP2. And of course, you can also extend this to couple cluster and things like that if you want. Okay, so that uh, all my examples here have been with water molecules just for simplicity. Uh, but of course, you, you, when you fragment something, ultimately for, to do interesting chemistry, you need to, to place these boundaries at, across covalent bonds. So here's the protein backbone um, that we use. So for example, here you have a, an amino acid and typically to fragment the molecule, we'll cut at this bond right here rather than the amide bond because this is a much more polarizable bond than, than this bond. So the idea is that this is now a fragment with, with the side chain here. That'll be our monomer. And so the, the question is now how to, how to deal with the, uh, the dangling bonds when you do the SDF. And so here we uh, use a frozen orbital method. So the idea is that this, we cut out a little, a little piece here, so not the side chain, but this little piece truncated with methyl groups, do an SDF calculation, uh, and extract the uh, localized orbitals, the localized orbitals that represent this bond. And so this uh, orbital here, which is sitting right here, will then be frozen in the SDF, and it'll keep uh, bad things from happening, basically, when you optimize for neighboring orbitals. Now this is done for every bond, so we don't assume that, that these bonds are equal. This is done for every bond during the calculation, and it's done in an automated fashion, so it's invisible to the user. Uh, this also means that 
if you want to fragment something else, like a zeolite or, or, or anything else, right, all you have to specify is where you want to fragment it. And then the, the code takes care of the rest. It'll, it'll cut out a piece, truncate it with methyl groups, extract the, the orbital and so forth. So there's no human intervention here other than defining where you want to cut. Okay, um, so this is implemented in games, as I said. Uh, it is implemented with gradients, so a lot of these fragmentation methods uh, don't have gradients uh, in them yet, and so obviously this is very important if you wanna, if you wanna apply this kind of thing. So here's uh, an example uh, for a small protein tryptophan cage. Uh, it's, it, we picked a small one so that we can do a full MP2 calculation on this, so we can see what the error set is. <laughs> okay, so when we calculate the energy fully MP2 and compare it, compare it to the EFMO energy and the FMO2 energy, the error in the total energy is four kilocalories per mole uh, for EFMO and six kilocalories per mole for, for FMO2. And I should notice here, and this is, this is important, that what I call a monomer now in this calculation is actually two residues, okay? You get much worse results if you only have one residue per, per monomer, and that's because, if I can go back here, um, oh yeah, and so that, that can also, that allows me to talk about this. So when you, when you make cuts here and here, these, these dangling bonds get, become too close. So it's better to have two residues uh, within a monomer. And the reason you don't want them to be close is that we have induced dipole polarizability everywhere in the molecule. So we will actually calculate uh, the classical polarization energy between this monomer and this monomer, meaning that you have uh, fields from atoms that are very, very close to the polarizability tensor, which is sitting in the middle of the bond. And so that, that, since we iterate for self-consistency, that always diverges unless you, you screen uh, the Coulomb potential very aggressively with some exponential function, for example. And so that is actually where most of the error is coming from in the calculation, uh, in the EFMO calculation, is, is that this uh, induced dipole here tends to get very large because you have, you're trying to model something classically that really is covalently bonded. So, but by doing um, aggressive screening, you can, you can, we can almost, we can get it to converge almost always. And as you can see, the, the error is, is comparable to, to an FMO2 calculation. If you, do, if you do the gradient, so that's accuracy, how do, how do we do in speed? Uh, in speed, we're not much better right now. And that is because most of the time when you do an MP2 gradient evaluation, most of the time is spent calculating the dimers that you do quantum mechanically. Uh, and so, since we don't at present try to approximate that in any way, we do it exactly like the FMO method, and so uh, the calculations of uh, times are relatively comparable. But of course, this is just a, a starting point uh, for doing more interesting things, All right? So to do. Um, one way, uh, one thing, or one place you can go with this is QMMM. Uh, so the idea is now that uh, for many QMMM studies, a lot of the, the protein structure that you represent is fixed. And if you fix the geometry right, in this region, you only have to calculate the monomer energies. You can skip all the dimer energies here because the only thing that will really change is the polarization and you do that classically. So this is actually a way of turning a linear scaling model into a QMMM model uh, simply by skipping a lot of the dimer calculations, right? So you still have uh, electrostatic interactions calculated with multipoles, the whole thing is polarizable, and so forth. There's no adjustable parameters, and the boundary is basically defined by uh, the, the monomers that are no longer geometry optimized. Okay, so you'll still do ab initio calculations that connect these two uh, regions. So it's a QMMM method from that point of view. This will be very fast, and it'll have no adjustable parameters. And of course, we also have to include TCM, uh, surround the whole thing with a polarizable uh, model. The other thing you can do is to uh, use all the tricks we developed in the EFP method 
to cut down on the number of dimer calculations, and that will also speed it up significantly, right? So things like uh, charge transfer and exchange repulsion and dispersion especially, of course, is going to speed this up tremendously. So one way to think about this is actually that this is a way of, of having uh, effective fragment potentials that, that uh, have flexible geometry, so you can optimize this. Okay, finally, um, the setup for these fragmentation methods can be a little bit painful because you have to define all the cuts. And so a student in my group, uh, together with Casper, has made a, a program called Fragit, which, which, which is on the web, and it's basically a graphical user interface that allows you to set up these complicated enterprise. Okay, funding for this uh, is from the EU, and that's basically all I have to say. I'm happy to answer questions, and if you have questions later, uh, you, can, you can, if you want, you can send me an email or you can leave them on this blog where you also will find the slides for this talk. So thank you very much. If you either have, I mean, typically you want to avoid very small fragments. So one fragment may have three residues at the end. Well, for a given protein, you basically define the fragmentation. And so if you have an odd number of residues, right, one, of, one fragment will be a little bit bigger than all the other fragments. But, but there's no inherent problem in that at all in, in the algorithm.